What's up everybody, Gen X Dividend Investor here. In this fun video I'll tell you about 18 cheap dividend stocks across a bunch of different sectors, six of which I own. All of the stocks are at least 10% underpriced relative to one-year target estimates of mine, as well as professional analysts. And all the stocks have at least 10 consecutive years of dividend increases. Of course, that doesn't mean you should run out and buy or sell anything without doing your own research. I'm not a professional, and me calculating that something is underpriced doesn't mean it's guaranteed to go up, and so definitely don't take this as accurate investment advice. And be aware that this isn't a stock analysis video. I'm just going to be sharing a few relevant pieces of info about these companies, but you should always dig much deeper to understand a business's financial statements, trends, risks, competition, etc. before ever doing any investing. At the end of this video I'll explain something I've shared in previous videos, which is how stock prices gravitate towards intrinsic value, which to me is actually the most important takeaway from what I'll be sharing. And as a fun treat, I'll show you various pictures and videos of my recent vacation as I go through the stocks. Like, here's a wall of chocolate that we came across in a chocolate store in Lucerne, Switzerland. So please do me the giant honor of hitting that thumbs up button, subscribing if you haven't yet, and clicking that bell notification. Note I'll be sharing these stocks based on alphabetical ordering of their sectors, and I created this video in the beginning of August, so prices might have fluctuated from when you're watching. The first stock in my list is Verizon, ticker VZ. My one year fair value target price for VZ is $60, which is about 34% higher than it is today, as compared to analysts who have it at $54, which is almost 22% higher than today. VZ has a great 5.7% yield, a nice low 47% payout ratio, a very low 2.1% five-year dividend CAGR, and a solid 17 consecutive years of dividend increases. I think telecoms are in an unfavored state right now, so that pessimism is driving prices down a bit. A key concern people have about Verizon is its debt, which is actually now slightly more than AT&T's debt. On VZ's website, we see that their total debt is at a prolific $157 billion. AT&T's debt is also very high at a total debt of $136 billion. That is high, but it is way better than what AT&T was at before their recent WBD spinoff, which they were at $208 billion in debt. Yikes. Now, if I was someone who was focused on growing my portfolio size, then I wouldn't be looking at the telecom space, even though I think it's underpriced. But if cash flow was a key need I had, then I think VZ becomes more compelling. Okay, so our vacation started off in Disneyland, and here's a picture I took of some stormtroopers at the new Star Wars exhibit. Pretty cool. Moving on, the next stock on the list is Walgreens Boots Alliance, ticker WBA. My one year fair value target price for WBA is $50, which is about 27% higher than it is today, as compared to analysts who have it at $45, which is about 14% higher than today. WBA has a nice 4.92% yield, a 35% payout ratio, an OK 5% five-year dividend CAGR, and are a dividend aristocrat. Nice. WBA has a good amount of debt to be aware of, and another concern I have is that e-commerce pharmacies hurt them to some degree. Like Amazon has a new online pharmacy that I've been using, and it's awesome, and Mark Cuban recently opened up his own online pharmaceutical store called Cost Plus Drugs. Plus, if Amazon starts building brick-and-mortar pharmacies, as has been rumored, it will further hurt companies like WBA. But I still go to Walgreens for some stuff, and if they had some same-day doctor services, then that would make them even more compelling. Okay, let's move on. Here's a quick video I took of a water show at D-Land called World of Color, which reflects light off water that is shot up in the air. Really amazing stuff. Did everyone see that? Because I will not be doing it again. The next stock in the list is a SIN stock that I own, and that's British American Tobacco, ticker BTI. I highlighted all the stocks in green that I own. My one-year fair value target price estimate for BTI is $55, which is about 39% higher than it is today, as compared to analysts which have it at $51, which is about 29% above today's prices. BTI has a very high 7.54% yield, a 65% payout ratio, a decent 5.6% five-year dividend CAGR, and 22 consecutive years of dividend increases. Since stocks like this face tons of headwinds from more health-conscious populations to risk of regulations impacting their earnings. 
BTI is trying to evolve by offering more combustible-free products. They face some geopolitical risks from the current Russian-Ukraine war, though that's a relatively small impact to their total revenue. Some big funds have dropped SIN stocks lately, so that's another risk to be aware of. I like the income BTI provides me, and I think it'll be able to do that for my life, but I'm not really in it for the long-term price appreciation. Also, a big thing to be aware of is that due to currency conversions, the dividend can fluctuate up or down. Okay, let's move on, kind of like we did on our vacation when we left Disneyland and went to France, and specifically Paris. Here's a picture I took on my iPhone of the Eiffel Tower as we walk towards it. Okay, the next stock on the list is Tyson Foods, ticker TSN. My one-year fair value target price estimate for TSN is $105, which is about 29% higher than it is today, as compared to analysts who have it at $99.50, which is about 22% above today's prices. TSN has a relatively low 2.1% yield, a very nice and low 18% payout ratio, a great 17.2% five-year dividend CAGR, and an okay 10 consecutive years of dividend increases. Tyson owns some classic meat products, and they have a small presence in plant-based meats with their raised and rooted brand. My daughter recently told us that she's a pescatarian, and I had no idea what that was. Apparently it's a vegetarian that eats seafood. So we've started trying some of those fake meat products, and they're okay, but not as good as the real thing. And here's a picture I took outside the famous Louvre Museum in Paris. You might remember this picture from the Da Vinci Code movie with Tom Hanks. Great movie. Okay, the next stock in the list is Enterprise Product Partners, ticker EPD, in the energy sector, and is an American midstream natural gas and crude oil pipeline company, and is a master limited partnership, aka MLP. MLPs are their own business entity type that you should dig into, kind of like REITs are their own beast. MLP's business model is about using most of their cash flow to distribute decent payouts to investors. They fund growth through external debt and equity issuances. Generally speaking, MLPs don't owe any income taxes and pay out almost all of the cash flow in the form of distributions, which is their version of dividends, and one nice thing about them is that their yields are often higher. They also have some tax complexity to be aware of, as you get a K-1 form rather than a 1099. Instead of you being called a shareholder, you are called a unit holder. MLPs may incur unrelated business taxable income, aka UBTI, that could be taxable even within a retirement account, so consult a tax professional to learn more. I personally would just hold them in taxable accounts. Anyways, even if you receive no cash distributions, your taxable income will include your share of the MLP's taxable income. You need to track your tax basis carefully with MLPs, as your basis is decreased by the amount of cash distributions you receive, which are classified as return of capital, and is increased by your share of MLP's taxable income, or decreased by your share of the MLP's losses. This is kind of like a tax-deferred distribution in the sense that you don't pay full tax on your distributions until you sell your shares and realize a gain. So the ROC portion of a distribution, rather than be taxed right away, instead decreases your cost basis, potentially all the way to zero. At that point, the distributions are taxed as long-term capital gains, just like qualified dividends. When you sell an MLP, then the government will recoup those deferred taxes because your capital gain will be larger by the amount of your cumulative ROC. Anyways, many of the energy companies out there are currently hot due to the bull energy cycle we've been in, and some people will think that, that will remain the case for years to come. No one knows. If you are a bull, then investing in energy companies may make more sense. If you think we're at a peak, then you'd probably be avoiding any energy companies. My one-year fair value target price estimate for EPD is $35, which is about 35% higher than it is today, as compared to analysts who have it at $29.56, which is about 14% above today's prices. EPD is an awesome 7.39% yield, but we don't use payout ratio for them kind of like for REITs we don't, and they have a low 2.4% five-year distribution CAGR, and an awesome 22 consecutive years of distribution increases. For MLPs, a metric kind of similar to payout ratio you can use is the distribution coverage ratio, which is basically a measure of how much money an MLP has left over after paying their distributions. A distribution coverage ratio of 1 means that the MLP paid out all the money it had for distributions. A 2.0 coverage ratio means that the MLP paid out about half the money it had available for distributions. And instead of PE, you might want to look at price over distributable cash flow. You can pull a lot of those metrics in their presentations, and since I'm trying to keep this short, I'll leave that exercise to you, if EPD seems interesting. Speaking of interesting, here's a picture in the hallway of the Louvre. Look at how exquisite and ornate it is. Wow. 
Moving on, I grouped these next two stocks together, both of which I own, and they are Chevron and ExxonMobil. Gas stocks have done great this year, and in fact have pushed my dividend portfolio up to almost all-time highs right now, which is pretty amazing given some growth portfolios were down over 50% from their peaks. My one-year fair value target price for Chevron is $180, which is about 17% higher than it is today, as compared to analysts who have it at $177, which is about 15% higher than today. CVX has an OK 3.7% yield, a 37% payout ratio, an OK 5.1% five-year dividend CAGR, and are a dividend aristocrat. My one-year fair value target price for Exxon is $115, which is about 28% higher than it is today, as compared to analysts who have it at $107, which is about 20% higher than today. I should caveat that with much of where oil stock prices go will be based on macroeconomic factors like supply chains, the pandemic, the Ukraine war, and God knows what else. So I'm thinking that oil will stay hot for a while, but you never know, gas prices have been coming down lately. Regardless, Exxon has been navigating quite well, now their balance sheet is getting better and better, and I bet the meager dividend raises which we've recently seen should hopefully improve. Okay, now let's look at one of my wife's favorite scenes on vacation, which is when the Eiffel Tower lights up with sparkles at nighttime. Quite beautiful. And speaking of beautiful, the next stock in the list is in the financial sector, and is another I own in Goldman Sachs. My one-year fair value target price for Goldman is $450, which is about 34% higher than it is today, as compared to analysts who have it at $406, which is about 21% higher than today. GS is a low 2.39% yield, a great 18% payout ratio, a great 24% five-year dividend CAGR, and have been increasing their dividend for 10 consecutive years. I think the current economic climate could bring uncertainties to Goldman and to most financial stocks, but with risk can come reward. One negative influencing factor on Goldman is the fact that mergers and acquisitions throughout the industry are happening less and less due to the tough market we are in. But Goldman is the most premier investment company in the world, so they tend to come out on top in the long run. Dig into their price to book as compared to their peers for more insights. Okay, let's move on. Here's a picture I took of the most famous painting in the world, the Mona Lisa, by Leonardo da Vinci. It's of an Italian noblewoman, and it's actually painted on wood, not canvas. There was a huge line to go see it at the Louvre, where it's protected behind one and a half inch bulletproof glass and is kept at a specific humidity and temperature to keep the painting as pristine as possible. It's one of the most valuable paintings in the world, and it holds the Guinness World Record for the highest known painting insurance valuation in history at $100 million in 1962 which is equivalent to about a billion dollars today. The story behind the Mona Lisa is pretty fascinating. It was stolen in 1911, and even Picasso was brought in and questioned about the theft. Per wiki, the real culprit turned out to be the Louvre employee Vincenzo Perugia, who had helped construct the painting's glass case. He carried out the theft by entering the Louvre during regular hours, hiding in a broom closet, and walking out with the painting hidden under his coat after the museum had closed. Perugia was an Italian patriot who believed that Leonardo's painting should have been in an Italian museum, not a French one. Anyways, you have to put going to the Louvre on your bucket list. And something else you might want to put on your bucket list would be to own the next stock in my list, which is J.P. Morgan Chase. My one-year fair value target price for JPM is $155, which is about 35% higher than it is today, as compared to analysts who have it at $145, which is about 26% higher. JPM has a solid 3.46% yield, a nice 32% payout ratio, a great 15% five-year dividend CAGR, and 10 consecutive years of dividend increases, along with an incredible CEO in Jamie Dimon. Excellent. And excellent is what some king was probably saying as he drank from this mug I took a picture of in the Louvre. And he was probably wearing a crown that looks something like this. I bet that a king would own a bunch of financial stocks if he were still alive today, and he might even own these next three in my list, which are some awesome Canadian bank stocks, including Bank of Montreal, Royal Bank of Canada, and Toronto Dominion. Honestly, I could have included the other great Canadian banks, including Bank of Nova Scotia, Canadian Imperial Bank of Commerce, and a more regional player in National Bank of Canada, but it just went with BMO, RY, and TD for brevity's sake. The Canadian banks have been stellar dividend stocks, and while they face some challenges with debt and with potential bubbles and recessions and such, I'm guessing they'll weather the storm as they have for a very long time. Canadians have different regulations and risks than American banks, but their dividends are sacrosanct. My one-year fair value target price for Bank of Montreal is $130, which is about 31% higher than it is today, as compared to analysts who have it at $137, which is about 38% higher. BMO has a great 4.38% yield, a nice 34% payout ratio, 
a decent 8.4% five-year dividend CAGR, and I didn't list their consecutive number of years of increases due to the currency conversion issues, but I can say that they've been paying dividends since 1829. My one-year fair value target price for Royal Bank of Canada is $120, which is about 24% higher than it is today, as compared to analysts who have it at $109, which is about 12% higher. RY has a nice 4.08% yield, a great 39% payout ratio, and a good 7.8% five-year dividend CAGR, and has paid dividends every year since 1870. My one-year fair value target price for Toronto Dominion Bank is $85, which is about 31% higher than it is today, as compared to analysts who have it at $79, which is about 22% higher. TD has a great 4.25% yield, a solid 41% payout ratio, a good 9.3% five-year dividend CAGR, and has been paying dividends every year since 1857. TD and RY are the ones I'd be most likely to invest in, though really I think you can win with any of the great Canadian banks over the long run. And winning reminds me of this picture I took of the statue of the winged victory of Samothrace, or the Nike of Samothrace, or however you pronounce it. Awesome. Okay, the next stock on the list is in the healthcare sector, and that's AbbVie, ticker ABBV. My one-year fair value target price for AbbVie is $150, which is about 9% higher than it is today, as compared to analysts who have it at $162, which is about 17% higher. Okay, I said 10%, but 9% is close enough for government work, right? AbbVie is a good 4.09% yield, a 42% payout ratio, a great 17.5% five-year dividend CAGR, and are a dividend king. Hopefully everyone knows about AbbVie's main risks in Humira revenue that they're trying to mitigate as much as possible, and of course there are risks with regulations and policy changes and such. Okay, now let's move on to a picture of the Duomo Cathedral in Milan, Italy. Duomo is an Italian term for church. My wife and daughter loved Milan, I think because the shopping was so spectacular. Here we are inside the cathedral listening to beautiful sounds. And here's a picture outside of the cathedral. Too much incredible stuff to see, so let's move on to another inexpensive healthcare stock, and that's Merck, ticker MRK. My one-year fair value target price for Merck is $100, which is about 13% higher than it is today, as compared to analysts who have it at $99, which is about 12% higher. Merck has a decent 3.16% yield, a great 35% payout ratio, a good 8.8% five-year dividend CAGR, and an okay 11 consecutive years of dividend increases. Every company has issues to be aware of, so an example I'll call out for Merck is that a couple days ago the FDA announced that a possible cancer-causing agent was detected in certain samples of one of Merck's drugs. And that kind of goes with investing. There are always risks and no guarantees, so you've got to stay on top of your businesses and determine which risks are manageable and which ones you don't feel comfortable enough with. Anyways, another famous Da Vinci painting we saw on vacation was The Last Supper. It's a mural painting on the wall of a building in Milan that represents the scene of the Last Supper of Jesus with the Twelve Apostles, specifically the moment after Jesus announces that one of his apostles will betray him. During World War II, the building with the Last Supper was struck by bombs, but protective sandbagging prevented the painting from being destroyed by the explosions. After that bomb blew up, I'm guessing they probably could have used the services of our next stock, ABM Industries, ticker ABM, a company which provides janitorial, facilities engineering, parking, custodial, and other services. My one-year fair value target price for ABM is $55, which is about 23% higher than it is today, as compared to analysts who have it at $56, which is about 25% higher than it is today. ABM has a low 1.75% yield, a nice 22% payout ratio, a low 2.8% five-year dividend CAGR, but have over 50 consecutive years of dividend increases, making them a king. ABM has done a good job growing its earnings per share for quite some time, though I wouldn't call it a high growth company. I like the fact that it's boring and under the radar, just a steady eddy moving along, but one that is cheap right now. Moving on, the next place we went to was the beautiful city of Interlaken, which means between lakes, and is a popular resort town in the Alps in Switzerland. I swear this picture looks fake, it's so amazing. It's a cute place to visit, and we got to enjoy these fine Swiss folks blowing their horns. There are tons of incredible lakes and rivers in Switzerland, and a company that knows a thing or two about water is Pentair, which provides various water solutions as well as designs, manufactures, and sells pool equipment and such. Pentair has rebounded well from their pandemic lows, but still has a variety of areas of concern, such as their debt and rising costs, but I'll leave those details for you to research. My one-year fair value target price for PNR is $55, which is about 9% higher than it is today, 
as compared to analysts who have it at $65, which is about 29% higher than it is today. PNR has a low 1.71% yield, a nice 23% payout ratio, but I didn't list their 5-year dividend CAGR and number of years of dividend increases due to a spin-off they recently had, though they are still counted as an aristocrat. Okay, and then from Interlaken we went to Lucerne, another city in Switzerland. One thing I saw a lot of in Europe was smoking, which leads to the next stock on the list and one I own in Altria ticker MO. My one year fair value target price for MO is $55, which is about 24% higher than it is today, as compared to analysts who have it at $48, which is about 8% higher than it is today. I actually estimate the price is worth more than that, but I'm trying to be conservative given everything going on. MO has a nice high 8.16% yield, a high 77% payout ratio, which is in line with what their management drives to. They have a nice 5 year dividend CAGR of 8.1%, and in fact they should be announcing a hike in their dividend on the 25th of August, though I'm betting it'll be lower than their normal dividend increases, and finally they are a prestigious dividend king. Smoking stocks have tons of risks you are no doubt aware of. Ok, now let's leave Switzerland by listening to the church bells in Zurich. And that brings us to the final stock on the list which is National Fuel Gas Co, ticker NFG, a diversified energy company. My one year fair value target price for NFG is $80, which is about 13% higher than it is today, as compared to analysts who have it at $78, which is about 10% higher than it is today. NFG is a nice low 2.67% yield, a nice low 33% payout ratio, a low 5 year dividend CAGR of 2.5%, and are a dividend king. With crude oil prices at an 8 year high, National Fuel Gas sold its California oil drilling business to focus on its natural gas production operations closer to home in Pennsylvania. NFG is a conservative play, so if that appeals to you then start doing your due diligence and dig into its details. Ok, now before I jump into my spiel on intrinsic values, it's important you understand that one year price estimates can change as new information comes out. Anyways, let's talk about intrinsic values. Here's a picture I made to show you how stock prices and intrinsic values usually work. I'll explain the pick in a moment, but it's important to understand that there are lots of ways to value a stock, and one of the good ones that you can usually use for dividend companies are discounted cash flows aka DCFs. There are multiple videos on YouTube about discounted cash flows and calculating intrinsic values of companies if you feel so inclined. DCFs have some weaknesses, one of which is the fact that your results can vary dramatically depending on which input parameters you use, some of which can be subjective. So don't become overconfident in your estimates, and don't forget to look at relative valuations of competitors. And like anything with investing, using a variety of metrics and trends and data points usually gives you more insights rather than relying on just one, i.e. supplementing the DCF approach with other valuation approaches is often useful to develop a better understanding of the value of a stock. And since the focus of DCF analysis is long term growth, it's not an appropriate tool for evaluating short term potential. Ok, it's important to understand that regardless of what a stock's actual intrinsic value is, the market often overprices it or underprices it, but in the long run the market gets it right as stock prices trend back towards a company's actual intrinsic value. So I like to think of a stock's actual intrinsic value like its gravity or its a magnet as it's constantly pulling its stock price back to it. This was kind of summed up in Benjamin Graham's famous saying which was in the short run the market is a voting machine, but in the long run it's a weighing machine. Voting represents how people are using their dollars to either buy or sell stock, which is why a stock's price is often a popularity contest in the short run. However, in the long run the stock price trends towards its intrinsic value, which is analogous to saying that market forces slowly, but properly, price the stock, i.e. its real value is properly weighed and thus priced by the market. In the short term the gravity of intrinsic value can lose out to the more powerful forces like news headlines and world events and reddit warriors. The market often overreacts to good news or bad news, which value investors can then capitalize on. What I mean is that people often buy or sell based on emotion rather than on business fundamentals, which is why stock prices can do seemingly crazy things in the short term. But in the long term, gravity and physics and reality wins and stock prices trend towards actual intrinsic values, which are based on business fundamentals. That concept is super critical to understand if you want to be a good investor. It helps explain why certain things can be overpriced or underpriced for years, as stocks are popular or unpopular for years. But eventually business fundamentals win. If good growth comes, eventually the stock will respond. It can take a long time for people to forget about hated stocks or beloved stocks, but eventually they do if the company performs or doesn't perform. That's why you can see a crappy stock shoot up for a while, or a solid company trade in the dirt for a while. 
Your goal is to be able to identify when quality companies are cheap and then buy if it makes sense to you. Or perhaps sell if things are too expensive. It all depends on you. Another gravity example I like is that dividend income is like the fuel or the thrust of your personal rocket. A rocket which is trying to break free from the gravity of your expenses. Once you have enough fuel and thrust, aka dividend income, to break free from the gravitational forces of your expenses, then you blast away from your old life on Earth and you can fly away faster and faster into space with the freedom of your time. Okay, now back to the picture. The blue line is the intrinsic value, i.e. my target price, i.e. it's a magnet or it's gravity which is trying to pull the black line, which is stock prices, towards it. In this example you can see an intrinsic value estimation that goes up and down as time goes on and is slowly trending up like most quality companies tend to do over long periods of time. The black line, aka stock's price, tends to fluctuate wildly based on short-term news and headlines. The ideal time to buy a stock is when it's underpriced, which is represented as areas of red where the stock price fluctuates under its intrinsic value price. Now if your strategy is to buy and hold for generations, then buying at any stock price can work out. It's just that your returns will be less than if you buy when something is on sale, and it can take materially longer to get a good return if you just invest whenever. Similarly, the best time to sell is when it's overpriced, which is any period on this graph along the areas of green, because those are all times when the stock price is higher than the intrinsic value. This example chart could represent 20 years or whatever of stock prices, so you need to understand that something could be underpriced for years or overpriced for years, but stocks eventually tend to drive towards real intrinsic values, which you can calculate with discounted cash flow calculations and sometimes by analyzing price to earning trends. Of course, a low P.E. ratio doesn't automatically mean a stock is undervalued, and a high P.E. ratio doesn't necessarily mean a company is overvalued. But a 15 P.E. is often a reasonable valuation for most, but not all companies. So as earnings go up, then stock prices tend to go up, broadly speaking. A conclusion you should draw from this picture is that the difference between a stock's current price and its estimated intrinsic value becomes your investing opportunity. Assuming you believe the intrinsic value is a good estimation, and those who do invest like that are known as value investors, since they are transacting based on some form of fundamental business analysis, which attempts to calculate a stock's intrinsic or book value. Book value and intrinsic value are two ways to measure the value of a company, and there are a number of differences between them, but basically book value is a measure of now, and intrinsic value leverages forecasted estimates of the future. And don't day trade thinking you can guarantee a stock's movement based on any of this. I'm telling you where I think stock prices will trend over time, which is basically useless for day traders. Thus, this is meant for buy and hold investors. It also means that when I share stocks which I feel are undervalued, it means I think it will just be a matter of time until they revert back to their proper intrinsic value trend lines, though I have no real expectations of price movement in the short term. Okay, now I'd like to call out the Patreon aristocrats who have joined since my last video. So first, thank you Hugh Jazz for upgrading to a full year membership, which gets him a 10% discount. And thank you JT3000 for signing up. Thank you Tavon for signing back up. Thank you Kev LWM for signing back up. Thank you Top for signing up. And thank you PMP with Sean for signing up as an aristocrat. He has a new YouTube channel on project management that you should subscribe to if you're interested in that kind of stuff. Aristocrats gain access to my dividend spreadsheet product that I use in my videos, and they get to be in multiple private channels on my dividend discord chat server, where I let my upper tier patreons watch my videos before I release them publicly on YouTube, as well as they get to vote on which thumbnails I use for my videos, and of course they get more direct access to me. And if you made it this far in the video, then please hit the thumbs up button, subscribe if you haven't yet, and click that bell notification. Finally, I highly recommend that you join my free Dividend Discord chat server, which has thousands of investors on it and is growing all the time. Thanks for watching, stay positive, and I'll talk to you again real soon. I am not a financial advisor, and these videos are for entertainment, inspiration, and educational purposes only. Investing of any kind involves risk. I am only sharing my opinion with no guarantee of gains or losses on investments.